Natural Vector, about Britain's perspective on natural ecosystem and the Biome. Thank you very much. Right, yeah. So I'm going to present to you my PhD research in the High Andes. Um, so when you get to the High Andes, this is what you see. These vast expanses of grassland, which are called the Puna, which extend from northern Peru to Chile. But you have to ask yourself, how natural are these ecosystems? You have to ask that because human impact in these landscapes is really widespread. You've got llamas and alpacas getting, getting everywhere and they're burning these grasslands constantly. And this has been going on for a really long time. So forget the Incas, the pre-Incan civilizations. You've got hunter-gatherers up in the high elevation Peruvian Andes as far back as 13,000 years ago. And with all of this widespread and long-standing human impact, you have to, uh, you find that the only examples of natural pristine Puna vegetation are found, are found in really inaccessible areas such as this. But if we could access these areas and get ourselves some baseline data on natural ecosystem properties, we would be able to objectively assess the millennial scale impact of humans on this landscape. So this is what I did. M myself and my wife were climbers and we accessed these pristine zonal vegetation in the high Andes and got ourselves this baseline data. Now we focused on eight large sites across the Cordilleras Vilcabamba and Urubamba in southern Peru, close to Cusco, as you can see down here, as well as many other smaller sites. And uh, here are some examples of the sites. As you can see, completely inaccessible to, to surrounding livestock, to, to the human-induced ground fires, and uh, of course, humans. And to get to these sites, we, uh, we, it, we trek through some spectacular scenery, established base camps for months on end, we'd be camping, and we'd be climbing to access these sites. And upon arrival, we would then compare the vegetation and the soils with the surrounding accessible landscape. And we did this over three years. It was a lot of field work. We amassed a lot of data, as you can see here. Now, what I'm going to do now is talk through some of the main discoveries. There were a lot made, and, uh, and uh, I'll go through one by one. So we start, if we start off, we did a landscape mapping study of the entire Cordillera Urubamba, whereby we mapped forests and grasslands and azonal areas across the entire Cordillera Urubamba. And then what we did is we also mapped inaccessible areas onto this, and we, and we looked at the proportions of forest and grassland within uh, the pristine inaccessible areas and the disturbed accessible areas. And what we found was there was a lot more forest in the pristine areas compared to the disturbed areas. Now, if we assume that these pristine areas are representative of the entire variability in the landscape, we could infer that human impact has led to a 90% forest reduction, which is massive. Um, if we look in more detail and look at the forest plots, what we find is that in the pristine forests, they're a lot denser, as you can see here in the stand basal area. And also, the trees were a lot larger, as you can see here in the mean height of the trees in the, in the DBH as well. Now, while doing this, we also found a, an interesting thing. We found the world's tallest high elevation forest. So we found trees 11 meters tall at four at 4,800 meters. I mean, why is that? We are still working on this. Um, we also found an interesting thing in the forest structure, which was that these pristine forests had a high proportion of standing deadwoods. Now, that in itself is interesting, but if you, if, when you look closely at these deadwoods, you find that they, they cover, they, they've got this unique, highly diverse epiphytic lichen and bryophyte communities growing on them. Whilst on the live trees, you don't find any of that because they've got this flaky bark that effectively sheds the bryophytes and doesn't allow anything to become established. 
And this is why this has never been seen until now. Now, I'm not going to go into any more detail on this. this is, my wife is the lichenologist, so I'd advise you all go and see her lecture tomorrow. Um, if we look, get onto vascular plants now, now this, to me, I'm a botanist, so this is absolutely amazing. If you take this photo, take away all the shrubs that you see, everything else you've got there is 100% new species. Now these, these pristine ecosystems were dominated by new species of tussock grass in the genera Calamagrostis and Pistuca. And the other species as well had very restricted range sizes and we knew that from of all the species, we, uh, we, s we took their latitudinal range data from Tropicos, and you can see that here. So the, the you find many, many narrow endemics in, these pristine, in this pristine vegetation. What we also found was that the pristine forests were especially important for these new species. We found that upon doing indicator species analyses, a quarter of all the indicator species of the forest were new species. And here's some examples here that have been published already. Now, so I've just told you all about the pristine vegetation. What about the disturbed vegetation? And what you find is that, looking here, you find that there's a lot more higher local species richness. And that is because this disturbance, this grazing and burning, effectively opens up loads of niches so that many, many different species can, can become established and no single dominant species can take over. But what we did find was that there was a lot more alien species, so introduced species, such as Poanua, the Veronicas, Ranunculus repens, that you don't find in the pristine areas. And also, the species that you find there are a lot more widespread and generalized, as we found here by uh, looking at the range, range size data of these species. We also looked, so, so of the 334 species that we, are, that we have in these plots, we scored each one for their, for their trait re related, grazing and burning related traits. And then we, put, we subjected all that information to principal component analysis. And we found that human disturbance is effectively favoring species adapted to grazing and burning in these landscapes. So traits such as being spiny, cushion forming, or being able to regenerate very, very fast, such as having underground storage organs, or being rhizomatous. The, the plants in disturbed areas had these traits, whilst the plants in the, the pristine areas had none, none of it. They were not adapted to grazing and burning. They could not handle that. So from all of that, we can say human influence is causing a massive, has it having a massive effect on vegetation. But what about soils? Because we also studied the soils. Now this is interesting because we found that actually it has, at a local scale, a very negligible effect on most soil properties. However, we, are, we did find that vegetation type was having a very large influence, as you can see here in the soil minerals and also the pH. So this allows us to say that, so at the local say, scale, not, but if you consider this 90% conversion from forest to grassland. That implies that the, the entire soilscape has changed in these landscapes, and now it's favoring more acidic um, umbra soils. So with all of that information, we've got the soil, the vegetation data, what about the carbon stocks? So we found at the local scale that, like I said with the soils, the they were affected, they were influenced by vegetation with there being more carbon held in grasslands than in forests. Now, with the carbon held in biomass, as you can see here, and the carbon held in trees and in roots, you actually do see that, yes, they are impacted. There is a, there is a, a significant difference there. Um, but we, what we wanted to know was, with this data, this is at a local scale, we wanted to extrapolate that to the landscape scale using our data from the landscape mapping study. And what we found was this. So these are the current carbon stocks in the entire Cordillera Urubamba. And most of the carbon is held in the soils. But we, we were interested to see what would be the potential carbon stocks in this landscape based on 
using the data from our pristine sites in terms of the proportion of forest and grassland in these sites. And this is what we found. Now, we found that for the, for the carbon stocks held in biomass, there was a difference. But if you look at the carbon held in soils, there's not much of a difference there. And this is because grassland soils hold a lot more carbon than forest soils. So when we compare the potential and the current, what we find is that there's actually just an overall an overall 35% decrease in carbon stocks at a landscape scale. And there's from so millennia of human impact has led to a 35% decrease in carbon stocks. So, so if you consider 90% reduction in forest, it's only led to a 35% decrease in carbon stocks. That's, that's quite spectacular. I wasn't expecting that uh, at all. Which leads us on to the conclusion that of course, human disturbance is causing a massive effect on vegetation, but actually a relatively little impact on soils, at least at the local scale, and on carbon stocks at the landscape scale. Which leads me on to say that, of course, human influence is causing these massive effects, but it's also causing unexpected effects, such as in the carbon stocks and in the, in the soils. And these shifts are basically impossible to predict without getting some baseline data, which is why I'd thoroughly caution against any studies uh, attempting to uh, assess human impact without using baseline data. Thank you. Grazing and adaptive plants. So, so uh, the the natural um, na natural uh, grazing densities are not known at the current state. Now, this so we did find in these uh, pristine sites that there was natural grazing in terms of Viscacha. There was also the um, the, ma the Taruka, the mountain deer. But we are not sure of, of whether in these pristine sites there would be the, uh, th they would be experiencing natural grazing densities. Now, um, in terms of, y your question was related to these plants that are adapted to grazing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I think, I f so you've got to consider, so 15,000 years of human impact isn't enough time for species to have evo evolved. So these, these plants that we find there, they must have been present in the natural vegetation, because most of them, apart from the introduced ones, are autochthons. So um, so I, I reckon that these, these plants that we're finding now, they would have been present but in very small quantities in, in azonal areas, probably, such as in landslides or... or or maybe animal burrows. They found s similar, um, similar from similar studies done in the Himalaya. They they, they hypothesise that these plants would have come from, say, animal burrows, that sort of thing. But it's, it's a very difficult one to answer. That. Uh, yeah, I mean, what I could say, I, I prepared. Uh, so there is there are some areas in uh, in the, in the Cordillera del Cabamba, which I was considering there might be a really good study. Which were so in the in, the, in National Geographic and also in a, one of these rapid e ecosystem assessments, they were claiming this is the last high elevation wilderness untouched by humans in central in South America. So I was thinking if we could get to these, and so this is a photo from it. From it, and you can see it's a, it's a mosaic of polylepis woodland and grassland, but see whether in there, where would these where would these species that you find now that are dominating the, the entire, all these grasslands, where would they be found in there? And I assume it would be in azonal areas. Does that answer your question to uh, yeah. more or less? Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. The, the question was, 
No, so we, we, we were only focusing on zonal areas, so, so uh, we no, nothing uh, related to water bodies or any kind of a... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the landscape, in the, this landscape mapping study, we did not, uh, can we, we excluded those. It, w they w it might have a, a, a difference. Um, <laughs> potentially, maybe not though. I mean, uh, the, I mean, there are people who are working on Bofidalis, the study, of the call Bofidalis out there, um, but, the, the big problem is at the moment, all the Bofidales, I think that they are human, they are an anthropogenic ecosystem. So in here you can see, so all the data that we've got from carbon of these is, uh, is from anthropogenically affected Bofidales, which have a completely different species composition. These look completely different, they're dominated by other species. So that's also something that needs to be assessed. So, yeah. so thank, thank you, you thank you. Next. Uh, ready to go? Okay, yes. Uh, so my name is James and I'm a PhD student at the University of Liverpool. Uh, my PhD in general is on uh, fire ecology in the Serengeti. And uh, before I can go into the details of my PhD, I need to describe fire in the Serengeti. So this is going to form the first chapter of my thesis. So, uh, plants first emerged onto land about uh, 470 million years ago. And pretty much as soon as they've done that, they burst into flame. And they've been burning ever since in almost every terrestrial biome on the planet. Um, in places like Africa, uh, on land grasslands, they're particularly, they're particularly prone to fire. And there's a long association with uh, anthropogenic burning as well. Humans evolved in these systems and, um, and they've been manipulating fire in these systems for a very, very long time. As I said, I work in the Serengeti, which is here in East Africa. It's split between uh, southern Kenya and northern Tanzania and contains a large uh, complex of protected areas. And whilst we know that fire is important in savannas, we don't really know anything about fire in the Serengeti. We don't know what drives it. Uh, we don't even know what the patterns are because it's such a huge area that it's logistically impossible to monitor it on the ground. Uh, there's also different management objectives. So the Maasai Mara up here, for example, uh, in Kenya, they aim to suppress all fire. They say, no, fire is bad, and they aim to suppress it. Uh, we've got pastures here. We've got kind of adaptive management approaches in other places. Uh, we've got more prescriptive burning regimes in others. Uh, so so it's, it's a, a complicated system, and we really don't understand fire there. So uh, my objectives then are to, to describe fire, uh, and, and we, just, we determine it per fire regime. So that is how big are fires in a region over a period of time? How big are they? How frequent are they? Um, how hot are they? Uh, these kind of characteristics. And then also to explain the patterns which we observe uh, and find out what is driving them. So to do this, uh, I'm using satellite data, uh, which gives us the ability to examine fire on a scale and with a level of detail that has not previously been possible. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with MODIS data, um, the way it works is you have fires and a satellite flies overhead and it does two things. So number one is it detects the energy being given off by actively burning fires and it creates the active fire product. And so this gives us the date that the fire was first detected by the satellite and it also gives us uh, how much energy is being released by a fire, so how hot the fire is. Uh, so that's the first thing. And the second thing it does is it detects the burned areas which are left behind when a fire has, has gone out uh, and this is the burned area product. Uh, and it does that by detecting the difference in reflections between uh, a green area From this, you can detect the fire size, and you can also use it to work out uh, how long it was since the last fire, and you can do that sort of going back, back and back in time. So, um, both of these uh, products come in the form of a raptor, and the first thing we did for our analysis was uh, we took the raptor, in this case the green area would be burnt, uh, and we, we reduced it to a sense flow, so we, we, we reduced a polygon to a single point in space, and to that point we ascribe uh, four fire traits, so these are characteristics which can be used to describe the behavior of an individual fire. Uh, and for these, we use uh, the ignition date, so when it happened in the year, from 0 to 365. Uh, the fire 
side, the fire rate of the tower, so that keeps the intensity of how much energy is being given off, uh, and then also the time since the last fire uh, at that location. So, um, just that data set gave us 17,000 fires, uh, and that's just a, a point map again across our ecosystem. Uh, it covers about 15 year data period from September 2000 to July 2015. And um, the, this study area is 61,000 square kilometers, and the, the protected areas are about half of that. So, looking at the frequency of uh, each of our fire states, we have just number of fires uh, on the, the axis here, and each of our fire states in a plot. So, fire size, uh, this is just log fire size here. We can see that fire in Serengeti is usually small. So, about 40% of them are a quarter of a kilometer, which is the smallest that they can be. That's one pixel, or one square feet, that's what I'll say. That's one pixel. Uh, and about 80% are five kilometers square or less. But some of them are really big. So, some of them, uh, the biggest one was 2,300 square kilometers, which is a colossal area to have burnt at one go. Um, looking at the, the ignition date, so here we've just got months uh, along the bottom axis. Uh, Serengeti has a bimodal rainfall season, so two wet and two dry seasons. And uh, surprisingly enough, fire occurs when it's dry. Really important finding there. Um, looking at time since last fire, we have, we have years along the, the, the bottom axis here. So um, there's a wide range here from quarter of a year to uh, unburnt throughout the whole of our study period. So quarter of a year, three months, a fire, an area burning, and then a fire returning within three months is a really rapid recovery. The, the, the amount of growth that has to take place to allow that area to burn twice in three months is really quite phenomenal. Um, 24% of each system, uh, or 20 of our 24% of our fires occurred within one year of a previous fire, and 82% occurred within three years of a previous fire. So you're looking at a, a very large proportion of the ecosystem burning on a, on a very regular basis. Uh, and finally, uh, this is fire rate of the tower, how, how hot our fires are. And fires in the Serengeti are quite uh, hot compared to the limited data we have on other ecosystems. Uh, looking at the number of fires, here the, the, uh, the, the hotter the color, the more fires there are in a particular area. So there's loads of fires around the outside of our protected areas here. Um, but critically, there's pretty much no fires outside of protected areas. So within these protected areas, you're looking at about 22% of the land that's burning per year. Outside, less than 0.01%. So fire does not happen outside protected areas. Um, you can also see the national boundary between Kenya and Tanzania. There's a lot less fire in the Masai Mara than there is in the northern Serengeti, uh, which suggests that possibly the Kenyans are succeeding in their attempts to stop all the fire. Uh, this national boundary can also be seen uh, when we look at the time since last fire. So here again, uh, red, warm colors mean there's loads of fire, and cool colors mean there's not much fire, uh, or, or less frequent fire. So uh, the Masai Mara is a, a fire occurs a lot less frequently than in other parts of the ecosystem. You can also possibly see this area down here. Uh, this is an ecologically distinct zone, uh, which we call the short grass plain. Uh, it's low rainfall, but high nutrients, so it's where the nutrients are most engaged, and that's where the ecosystems are, and where things are relatively grey and just about fixed. So you might appreciate now why this area doesn't burn so often. Um, we have a very clear east-west split between our um, the, the ignition date, the fire seasons. So these ones in the west here are tending to burn at the start of the long dry season. And then the ones in the in the east are burning. Sorry, that's the wrong way around. The ones in the west. The ones in the east are, are then burning uh, at the end of the long dry season, or even the beginning of the wet season. So we're looking at kind of uh, September, October, uh, November. And we're not sure what causes this, but I'll just pass it back to Pat. Uh, we also see that this split is um, is shown when we look at the proportion burnt, and also the number of fires per square kilometer. Uh, so here, these are all our fire system management sites, and then that's the proportion burnt, and that's the number of fires per square kilometer. So these four here are these four in the west, and then these three here are these three in the east. So we have this pattern being maintained across several of our, of our metrics. Um, no, that's it. Okay, I'll hold that one. Uh, so what we want to do is we really want to use the system more closely, which might be to aggregate our fire states uh, into a raft set. We want to treat them as individual events. Uh, and so to do that, we are using a, a, a recently developed quantitative uh, metric, a basal metric called uh, Basing, it doesn't give you p-values, uh, but we can plot, uh, it gives you 95% confidence intervals, which we can plot. Uh, so this stuff down here is, is all of our code area. Uh, you don't need to look at it, but it's things like zone quality management, site control, pattern, all the things that you want to test for. Uh, and again, I haven't got time to go into it, 
cut, cut a long story short, it's rainfall. So rainfall is what's driving fire in the Chandra Desert. Uh, in the immediate term, it is uh, increasing the fuel rainfall, and therefore you get smaller and cooler climates. In the long term, more rainfall, however, means more grass, and therefore you get bigger copper fires uh, in these following dry seasons. Uh, this is the fire chart, and this one, and only this one, shows that the Masai Mara uh, is different from uh, the other areas of the Masai Mara network, uh, which suggests, again, that perhaps the Chinese are able to control at least some aspects of the fire regime, in this case, just the fire giant. Um, moving on to the central plans, um, we found over our 15 year data set that there was a really quite massive decline in both the number of fires and the area that's burning each year. Um, and these two things are very closely correlated. So the number of fires in the area of burn okay, uh, is very closely correlated. But they are not correlated with fire size at all. So the number of fires is going down, area of burn is going down, fire size is staying constant. Uh, and what this tells us is that from the point of view of fire, landscape connectivity is not changing. The fire size is not changing, we're getting fewer fires, which suggests that perhaps the number of emissions is going down. Um, this pattern, however, is that's, that's for the whole ecosystem. When we split this and we look at each management site separately, however, we find that only two of them are actually declining significantly. Uh, and we find this when we look at, again, this is, so this is proportion burn, but if we look at number of fires or fire size or any of our other fire traits, what we're finding is that uh, some sets of areas are changing significantly, either increasing or decreasing, uh, uh, and others are not. So we have this. So, uh, there could be several things which are causing this. Um, uh, it could be decreasing rainfall, but it's not, because you've got rainfall gradients across the ecosystem, and rainfall is not declining. Uh, it could be increasing wilderness population, but we do aerial surveys, and we're pretty sure that, in fact, the wilderness population has gone down slightly in recent years. Uh, it could be overgrazing by livestock, and this is something which I'm trying to quantify. There isn't good data on this at the moment, uh, but I'm using Google Earth to count cattle bones, which is exactly what Google Earth is about. Um, and uh, hopefully we will have some data from that and, and be able to make some common sense. Uh, I suspect that law enforcement is going to be a really key factor here. So if you imagine um, human populations have size of a certain area go up, that means more poachers, and poachers start fires for a whole load of reasons. But it also means that there's more livestock, and livestock eat grass, which means that there's less fires. So um, the critical factor there is going to be law enforcement and how effective it is, and it's a lot easier to keep cattle out of this set of areas Uh, so, conclusions. Uh, we wanted to characterize the fire regime. We find that it's highly variable spatially, and it's changing over time, and critically, uh, it's declining. And this means that uh, there's the potential for the ecosystem to become dysfunctional. Uh, with that bush encroachment, uh, will affect uh, the, the large herbivore species that will reduce migration. That will have knock-on effects for tourism. Uh, so it's something that we really should be quite concerned about. Uh, and then we also find that rainfall is driving the fire, but that humans might be able to have an effect. Uh, and that's Some are managing the fires, um, starting fires for their own good, and some are poacher fires, and some are fires for predation villages. Uh, and the, uh, the, the data spatially, the data doesn't exist. Uh, it's possibly in one protected area, but it might have that data. Okay. One more very quick question. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. Um,
on the architecture, sticking to fire on free form and architecture in African savannas. It's mm -hmm. continuing on the mm -hmm. cycle. Mm -hmm. um, did you? Hmm? Is that yours? No. Okay, um, hello. So, yeah, I'm going to talk today about the effects of fire on um, savanna trees. The previous talk set it up really well, so thank you very much. Um, okay, so when, we, when I'm going to talk about tree form, structure, and architecture, I'm basically going to be focused on allometric scaling. So, I'm just going to quickly introduce the concept of allometric scaling, look at um, trees and savanna systems, and then look at some of these al allometric models. Okay, so tree al allometry basically establishes the quantitative relationship between um, patterns and forms in trees, or any allometric relationship for, for organisms. Okay, so you can look at relationships between um, uh, tree height, um, tree stem diameter, crown, bowl height, and all those kind of things. Um, tree architecture is actually crucial um, for an individual's ability to survive and compete. It, its ability to compete for light and other resources, the ability to uh, withstand extreme uh, weather events, uh, disturbance like fire. Um, so it's very important to understand uh, the architecture of trees. Okay, um, allometric scaling kind of went out of fashion. It used to be quite big to um, estimate basically timber stocks for um, timber industries. But in about the last 10 years, there's been a renewed interest because we use it to basically estimate biomass and carbon stocks. Okay. So tree height and diameter um, allometric relationships, and this is basically what my research has looked at, is uh, tree height and stem diameter, basically can be um, described as a, as a normal power function. So it ends up having quite an asymptotic curve. Um, so eventually height gets constrained with, with stem growth. Okay. Th the theoretical models of, um, of allometric equations, so here we've got um, the A is basically the scaling constant and the B is the scaling exponent. Much of the theories focus on scaling exponents, so what really caps tree growth, right? Um, and there's different biomechanical um, theories behind that. So the first one is the elastic similarity model, which is basically constrained um, uh, by pressures of gravity. So a tree will inevitably, if it carries on growing, will buckle under its own weight. And this theory denotes B, the scaling exponent, as two thirds, so 0.66 approximately. Okay. Um, similarly, but in a completely different theory, but the metro metabolic ecology model, um, which is based on size and metabolic rate, which can also be applied to plants, not just animals, also denotes um, the scaling exponent at 0.66. Um, and then the stress similarity model. Um, basically assumes that wind st stress on a tree eventually constrains its height, and that denotes it at a half, so 0.5. There are other models. There's the geom geometric growth model that um, basically allows trees to grow, grow exponentially, but they're quite on rare occasions, so things like redwoods would only really apply to that equation. Um, so as boring as those models may be, um, most empirical research shows that um, most trees begin to show a, a scaling component of 0.66. Okay, this is a bit of a backdrop to my research so we can kind of basically compare savanna trees to normal tree models. Um, so the issue with these models is they basically, as they're assumed on specific biomechanical constraints. Um, and they don't really take in for selection pressures and environmental um, um, conditions. And most importantly, the trees that are used to validate these models are nearly usually always trees in, in forest systems. But trees in savannas are quite different, uh, and they experience different conditions. They don't, they don't really have a competition for light. They're often much more open landscapes. Um, but they often are water-constrained, um, so they may be much more below ground by um, competition. Um, also, they're quite likely to get munched on by quite mega herbivores in Africa. And also, fire um, is, is a large disturbance that creates a kind of global herbivore effect. And mainly, I'm going to focus on fire. So, with fire, um, so these are my not so good fire flames, but um, a tree can have, basically, kind of has two traits um, open to it. 
Um, so it can either accumulate height quickly to escape the fire zone um, and allocate energy to below ground um, biomass to allow re-sprouting. Often these two traits are, are together. You'll have temporal niches where trees will accumulate a lot of bi uh, biomass to the roots, which then is then expended to re-sprout after fire. Okay? Or they can um, basically grow thick bark um, and have thicker stems, so they're less likely to be damaged after fire. And all of this will have a trade-off with allometric scaling and how basically tall your tree can be. Okay, and often all these um, allometric scaling uh, models and the empirical studies that look at these <coughs> often kind of forget about savanna trees uh, and the effect of dis disturbance. Okay, so this research basically was examining um, how uh, height diameter varied under two very distinct different savanna types, so a dry savanna and a wet savanna. So a wet savanna here same as a savanna that is a savanna but is maintained by fire because the rainfall would allow it to turn into a, to a closed system. And then also to see um, um, how these allometric scalings affected on different fire frequencies. So we looked at fires that were burnt every year, every two years and every three years. Okay, so um, this was done in um, South Africa in Kruger National Park. Um, it was conducted in the experimental burn plots, which is one of the oldest um, running experimental burn plots in Africa. Um, and basically, for those of you who aren't familiar with the EBPs, this is basically what they look like from up high. So they're just basically dug out squiggles that are burnt every so uh, often, well, every, every year, every two years, every three years, and they've been running since the 50s. So it's really rare to have quite a long data set or at least an experiment running um, experience the same conditions on these trees. Okay, so we measured an awful lot of trees. We basically ran transects through these plots and we measured basically tree height and stem diameter. Okay, over 5,000 trees were um, measured across the, um, the different savanna plots and the mixed effect model was used to examine quite a lot of uh, effects on tree height and, and diameter. So things like multi-stemmed trees, region um, and fire frequency. Um, so we basically threw an awful lot of mud at the wall to see what stuck and um, turned out fire and climate were very important. So we used those parameters of the model, ran um, these models to basically generate our own allometric um, power function equations for each basically area um, under a different burning regime. Okay, and this is what it showed. So um, this is for the wet savanna. And um, this is for the dry savanna. Okay, so um, the green is um, basically where you're burnt every three years. The blue is a complete fire exclusion, so the control. Uh, the orangey yellow is something that's burnt every two years, and the red is burnt every year. Right, and so for the wet savanna, we do see a difference. We do see that actually trees are capped at things that are burnt more frequently. Um, but the difference isn't huge. But what we see in the dry savanna is there's this really distinct difference in fire frequency. And most importantly, actually, what we see, because the, the y-axis are different, is that tree growth is heavily constrained in dry savanna. So height accumulation just does not occur um, to the same level as wet savannas. Um, if we look at a dry savanna that has no fire on it and hasn't had any fire on it for over 50 years, it's still not reaching really the same height accumulation as trees in in a wet savanna that's burnt every year. So we've got this really constrained growth. Okay, so um, these are just them broken down. These are the models, I'll think there's a bit of spread. Um, for the wet savanna, there was less variation. In the dry savanna, there, there, wa there, was, a, there was a bit more. <coughs> okay, so these seem, these are basically the physical equations that we created from this allometric scaling. I know there are an awful lot of numbers, but um, what we see is for the control and triannual um, uh, fire um, management regimes, the scaling exponent is um, 0.66, well, similar to 0.66, and it's those treatments that are burnt every year or every two years that we see variation. Um, so when we look at the dry savanna, the um, annual fires and the biannual fires have a much lower scaling um, exponent. Um, but to be fair, you've got some that are over 0.66, some that are kind of under 0.66. You'd think if you use a model at 0.66, it would actually even it out, um, which is a fair point. 
What's actually also important is that the scaling constants are quite different. So the dry savannah are, are very much lower, or significantly lower, which is what's really constraining this ultimate um, height accumulation. And most importantly, in a lot of these allometric models, the, the intercept of the model, that the constant is often, often ignored. Okay, so, uh, so overall, um, savanna type, so this kind of rudimentary difference between wet and dry savannas, um, and fire frequency shows to be highly significant in altering tree height and diameter scaling. Um, often, savanna trees conflict universal models of allometric scaling. So some of them do, do show this 0.66, but for some of the annual fires, there's, there's really quite great um, differences. Um, and increased fire frequency is significantly much more constrained in dry savannas than, than in wet savannas. So we do have some variation in wet savannas, but it's not entirely surprising that trees are a little bit smaller that are burnt every year compared to trees that aren't. But in the dry savannas, this, this difference is, is significant. Okay. Um, so um, the implications of this is that universal models of allometric scaling um, may not always be appropriate to systems with high disturbances. So we see that some are lower and some are higher, so maybe they average them out. But when savannas, which cover you know, about 20 to 25% of the world's land cover, are hugely um, heterogeneous mosaic systems, having a universal model may not be applicable for, for highly disturbed environments. Um, and that may be... Uh, a disturbance needs to be considered for this. Um, yeah, so fire and dry savannas can have adverse effects on tree structure. Often when we look at fire management, uh, fire tends to have little effect on dry savannas in terms of um, tree population, tree density, because the overriding factor is rainfall. But here we see that actually things like uh, allometric scaling, which affects biomass, will be lowered. And this is often overlooked. Um, furthermore, um, often in a lot of allometric equations, um, the intercept is often ignored, but here we saw a distinct climate difference. Um, and actually, most importantly, allometric scaling feeds directly into biomass estimations. So you can have independently simple um, biomass equations that are also power functions, and they, and they are also under the same theoretical model. So um, the met metabolic ecology model or the stress assimilatory model, or also have power functions for biomass. So if these scaling allometrics for tree height and diameter vary, then it's assumed that they could vary for biomass. But that's for kind of just simple, com simple equations. For more complex biomass equations that directly use tree height diameter scaling into estimate biomass, um, basically this can be concerning if we don't include disturbance because it may be under or overestimating biomass. And the reason why this is important is um, because often estimations of woody biomass is used for projects, things like Red Plus and other kind of carbon mitigation schemes. And in Africa, over 40% of um, Red Plus projects are located in savanna landscapes. And so areas in woody biomass, or just assuming that all the savanna trees work similar to forest savanna trees, could create error um, and also has implications for vegetation dynamic models and carbon stock estimations.
morning i'm going to talk about the factors that maintain uh, tropical forest grassland mosaic in the western ghats of india so across the globe across the globe you find few ecosystems where trees and grasses two extreme plant communities co-occur within the same landscape and many times with the abrupt transition between them one such unique ecosystem does exist in the at the highest higher reaches of the western ghats uh, biodiversity hotspot so at the higher reaches uh, forest patches made of stunted tropical evergreen trees are surrounded by grassland these uh, forest these forest patches are locally known as shola forest and hence this ecosystem is called shola grassland ecosystem the factors that maintain this unique forest grass mosaic has been discussed and debated for over centuries among scientific community but without a uh, conclusive evidence i'll come back to that question in few moments uh, just a little more about this ecosystem these ecosystems are highly diverse and they are well known for uh, very high endemism these ecosystems are source of many major rivers that sustain millions of people in the plains of south india and these are ancient they are in existence for more than 20000 years and they are known uh, the forest and grassland are known to under undergone expansions and contractions with the past climatic changes however uh, uh, in last 200 years more than climate it's human activity that have changed these ecosystems at large some 200, uh, 150 years back he was introduced and widely planted in this landscape and to supply fuel and food uh, this industry acacia myensi a species from australia a tree species uh, was planted here uh, in this landscape and as a consequence uh, large tracts of forest grassland mosaics were lost to this plantation in recent decades to make this situation worse this acacia managed to escape from those plantations and now invading the remaining tracts of grass so on the one hand we have uh, native forest trees which are unable to establish in grassland but on the other hand this alien acacia is been uh, establishing and invading the grassland in this context we ask the question whether what limits these native trees to establish in adjoining grassland but does not limit invasive acacia to establish and invade the same grassland yeah. and what could be the probable impact of global climate change on this native and uh, invasive acacia establishment in these grassland to address these questions i selected a wingiri biosphere reserve as my study area which harbors relatively large tracts of forest grass mosaic and also here the uh, invasion by acacia has become a serious issue of concern i did a preliminary survey here and we found very few well grown saplings of native trees in this grassland this indicates that the uh, the native tree establishment in grassland might be getting limited or restricted at their early life history stages such as germination or seedling stage so we decided to focus on these two stages of the uh, trees so to begin with the germination for as we know for any tree to germinate climate and soil potentially play a very important role so with this we asked our first question whether microclimate and soil properties of forest and grassland uh, influence the native and invasive acacia tree germination for this we selected 14 replicate forest grassland patches like this and in and we collected seeds of one common native species cygigium and invasive acacia at each of these replicate sites we selected four locations inside forest patch and four in adjoining grassland at each such location we placed three tree leaf grassland soil and shola forest soil and in each of these soil types we stored 25 seeds each of cygigium and invasive acacia and then we monitored their germination for three months periodically let's have a look at the results 
So here on y axis is the germination. This this graph shows germination in the forest microclimate at cross point type. Second one shows germination in grassland microclimate. I would like to highlight two main results here. First, across all categories, you can see the acacia germination in bluish bar is almost three times greater than that of maple tree germination, which shows that the greater germination potential of acacia could be one of the major factor behind its emergence in these landscapes. And other thing is we can see the native species germinated in grassland soil as well as in the grassland microclimate as well. So this shows that the grassland uh, germination is not a limiting stage for native trees to establish in grassland. So we move on to seedling stage and we ask the similar question whether microclimate and soil properties of the forest and grassland limit or influence the native and invasive tree seedling survival. For that, we selected two replicate forest patches and adjoining grasslands, and we collected seedlings of Cyzigium and invasive Acacia from our previous uh, germination experiment. So here at each location, we placed 10 seedlings each of Cyzigium and Acacia in polybag filled with forest soil and 10 seedlings each in polybag filled with grassland soil. And we monitored their survival for uh, eight months. Uh, what we found was here, uh, I analyzed these data using survival analysis framework. So on y-axis, it's a survival probability. And these are number of days since uh, experiment started. And these are corresponding seedlings. I would like to highlight results in the grassland. Uh, first, we can see that the, again, like germination, acacia seedling survival was significantly greater than that of maple seedling survival. And other thing is we can see the native seedling survival dropped down sharply, especially during the winter, which indicates that for native tree seedlings, it's the grassland winter microclimate that's that could be a key factor which limits their establishment in the grassland. So we decided to focus and investigate more on this grassland winter mi microclimate. One of the key difference in uh, uh, microclimates between forest and grassland here is sometimes during winter in grassland, uh, nighttime temperature drops down below zero and which leads many times to occurrence of frost in the grassland. Whereas at the same time, inside forest, temperature remains well above freezing point. We decided to focus on this and ask the question whether this nighttime freezing temperature and resultant frost in grassland limits or uh, influence the native the tree seedling survival in the grassland. So to, do, to address this question, we collected seeds of five native trees and invasive acacia from the tree. We germinated them in the greenhouse, and when they attained three months age, we transported them back to the field, and then transplanted into poly bags filled with grassland soil. We allowed them to acclimatize for one month, and parallelly, in the grassland, we selected three blocks spaced apart from each other by uh, 100 meters. Within each, uh, block, we had four replicate plots for as control plots and four other plots as experimental warming plots. So, and we placed the seedlings in these plots based on their uh, available number. So, uh, basically four to seven individuals of each of the species per replicate plot. So, as a <laughs> so during the experiment, we left control seedlings in control plots as it is, you can see here, uh, and allow we and expose them to the ambient weather. Whereas seedlings in experimental warming plots, we used to cover them every evening with the structures made up of thermal blankets. So these thermal blankets reduce the heat loss inside and maintain temperature three to four degrees higher than outside. Uh, and then we used to remove these structures next morning. So this way we conducted this experiment during peak win winter for two months. Let's have a look at the temperature regime in the control and experimental warming plots here. 
So if the minimum temperature on Y axis, we can see that this red line, which is a minimum temperature in experimental plot, with few exceptions, the temperature remained well above zero and also three to four degrees greater than that of control plot. Whereas in control plot, temperature dropped down below freezing point, freezing temperature quite a few times. Let's have a look at a result. So in first in control plot, we can see that the making tree seeding survival dropped down sharply and by the end of experiment, uh, less than 10% of the seedlings were survived. And we, when we protected them from this freezing temperature in the experimental warming plot, uh, the, their survival went high up above 40%, which clearly shows that it's freezing temperature and resultant frost that causes high mortality to these making tree seedlings and thereby restrict their establishment in these grasslands. Whereas acacia sur seedlings survived almost 40% uh, in, in the control, in the ambient environment, which shows that the acacia had uh, greater tolerance to freezing temperature and frost. And when these acacia seedlings were protected from freezing temperature, their survival goes high up, up to 90%. So to summarize these results, it's freezing temperature and frost that maintain, that causes high mortality to native tree seedlings and thereby maintain this unique forest <coughs> area project. Whereas the greater tolerance to freezing temperature and high germination potential of the acacia contributes to its ongoing invasion in these grasslands. The global, global climate change, especially increase in temperature may uh, increase the native tree establishment in grasslands, but it may amplify the invasion by Acacia myensis, which is a severe <laughs> extension threat to these grasslands. Yes. I would like to acknowledge these people and initiatives. Without their support, this would not have been possible. And thank you for your attention. microclimates as well as on both soil types. So it seems that soil is not playing that big role in this. Yeah, so I'm a bit the old one out here because I'm working on fresh waters, not on trees or <laughs> terrestrial landscapes. Um, so I'm a postdoc at the University of, uh, of Nottingham in Malaysia, so I'm based here in KL or near KL. Uh, and 
and I'm afraid we'll be colleagues, so we'll talk a little bit about my project and vice versa, masters um, specifically on my work in Borneo. Um, this is uh, the Baron River in Sarawak, and these are some lovely kind people that we had the pleasure to meet with their explanation. So I'm based in about here. Um, in KL or near KL on Peninsula Malaysia, which is um, Malaysia is part of uh, Sundaland, of course you know that um, it's a biogeographic region with very high levels of endemicity and biodiversity, but also experiencing uh, exceptional loss of habitat. So it's made up of uh, Malaysia, Brunei, um, and parts of Indonesia. Um, so this definition of this uh, biodiversity hotspot um, was actually based mainly on terrestrial organisms, once again, um, mainly mammals, um, lacteal plants, etc. And for this, they show 2.5 to 5 percent of the global species are endemic to this region. Uh, we don't have much data on freshwater organisms, but the data we have on fish supports similar endemicity levels, uh, but what I'm interested in is actually the kind of lower animals, freshwater invertebrates, and for this we have very, very little data. So there's a little bit on freshwater insects, like if you know, like dragonflies, or we also have some other arthropod uh, data on, on crab. Uh, I'm working on mollusks, uh, mainly on this spiral called freshwater mussels, and for this we have really almost no data for this region. There are about 800 species worldwide. Uh, they can be find on all found on all continents except the Antarctic, and they are one of the most uh, threatened groups of animals worldwide. About 10% of the species in North America, that's about 30 of 300 are already extinct. Uh, so in the past three, four decades in North America and Europe. This has led to a lot of uh, research and conservation. So millions and millions of euros are being spent on the protection of species in Europe. But as you can imagine, in Sunderland, like nobody cares about them, <laughs> um, as for, for many other invertebrate groups. So these are kind of my project aims because we have so little data on them. We don't even know what species there are, how many there are, uh, and what are the changes, what are the threats. So kind of I'm starting from scratch a little bit there for Malaysia for now. <coughs> I hope ultimately that I can uh, kind of get some protection for some of these most endangered species there. And I hope uh, I have kind of a good incentive for people or like the government to do this because Freshwater mussels are known uh, for the ecosystem values. They are biofilters. So you see an aqu uh, aquarium with and without mussels there and see what they are doing to the water. Uh, they are also eaten. So this is uh, uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Art and, and Manuel from, from the ISCN, uh, who are in, in a market in uh, Kanawit in Sarawak <coughs> where people are selling these mussels. So they are being eaten there much more frequently in Vietnam and also parts of Africa, uh, but Malaysia as well. <coughs> and of course, they are known for their pearls. <coughs> the main threats that we know of, uh, or that are usually given in the literature, which is based mainly on, on temperate data, are these here. Um, so pollution, sedimentation, eutrophication, that's nutrient enrichment. Uh, of course, dams will kill off a lot of the populations for hundreds of kilometers up and downstream of the dams. Um, because these are benthic animals, so they live in the bottom and they are filter feeders, so if you change the environment, they will die. They can't move anywhere. Um, loss of host fish, this, so they, they, they need host fish to reproduce. If you lose these fish, you will lose your mussels uh, and non-native species uh, who are displacing them sometimes. Uh, so these are just some pictures where I have some indication that similar things are happening in, in Malaysia. This is in Kelantan. So if you have uh, logging going up on upstream, then this is what your river will look like. We have a lot of pollution problems in Peninsula Malaysia because it doesn't work very well. Um, <coughs> and then we have uh, Southeast Asia's largest dam in the Rajang ba Basin in Sarawak. This is actually just an indication of over-harvesting, uh, all of these are pearls, these are from the freshwater pearl mussel in Europe. Um, 
of course, we also have different problems in the tropics, and like, uh, especially in Timberland, and I don't have to tell you about deforestation there. Uh, I think they're all <laughs> uh, terrestrial ecologists. Just kind of the extent of the problem is really massive of what has been done in the past 20 to 30 years uh, in, in Timberland, especially, uh, actually the whole of Timberland <laughs> almost, I know, from Peninsula, Malaysia, Borneo, uh, Sumatra for sure. Um, and most of this, of most of this land has been converted to a palm plantation with places like this. So obviously this has also a, a big effects on the, on the rivers that are flowing through this landscape. So what I did for my project first and foremost was check what data there are already for the macro distributions in this area. <coughs> so I only concentrate on Malaysia now, which is, is this part and then northern Borneo. And there is not much available, as you can imagine, and most of the records are very, very old. <coughs> so most of my records are from museums, and they are about 100 years old, or at least 50 years old. Very, very few people have gone there to look at these things in the past 50 years. Uh, this makes a problem also because um, all these species are identified only or based on morphological descriptions, and they are very plastic, these animals. So really, we need to look at the genetic data to actually find out how many species there are. Uh, this is what I do then. So I just have to go out and sample the whole country, basically, or as much as I can. <coughs> we, I always have a local field assistant with me who speaks the local language. It's actually in Sabah, Sarawak. We need somebody who also speaks some indigenous languages, hopefully. Um, and here we are with some Penan people in the Baram Basin. And we just kind of ask them if they know if there are mussels there. Also, if it's safe to go into the rivers, because as we've heard, that there are mainly some crocodiles, the very, very large parts of these rivers. And uh, this is the sophisticated way of how we sample this. <laughs> so basically, you have to jump in there, and, and sometimes you have to dive. The water level is very high. Uh, so yeah, uh, if there are crocs, <laughs> I can't go in, basically. And then we're taking... Um, tissue samples for um, uh, molecular barcoding, so we're using the C1 gene as kind of a generating. Uh, all the vouchers are being deposited in local museums. This is just one summary of my Peninsula Malaysia data set, which is already published. Um, so for here, we sampled about 160 sites. We found 10 species, nine of them native, one non-native. <coughs> um, three of them have really declined obviously. Um, so this is what the situation before 1970s and this is the situation in 2015. So this is the non-native species which are spread everywhere. And these uh, one species we might have already lost, I couldn't find. Um, and two of the species are really restricted here only like Lower Pahang. And this is a problem because it's actually endemic to Pahang only. Um, and this one we only could find here. Um, this is the uh, historical data set for northern Borneo, which is very, very little, of course. Um, so there are a few more data sets which are very general, so uh, a few more data points, like Tenoresno, for example, I have a few records for Sarawak, <laughs> wherever <laughs> that is, it's very big, and, and kind of these dashed lines indicate my, uh, the extent of my study area because here basically means I couldn't sample because of crops and here couldn't go yet. So, but it's quite a large area. And I also consider Brunei as being within my study area because I sampled all of these. Uh, in this area, this like based on historical records, there should be like five species, all of them from different genera. Most of them endemic to the region, at least to Borneo. <coughs> There's one record of this uh, Chinese species from 2002 from a, um, from a market, actually. And yeah, of course, the records are very, very old, so most of them are, were collected before everything changed in this area. This is what we sampled this year, basically. So the white uh, circles are sites where we couldn't find any mussels. Like, if the Chinese species is red, it's a native species. We could find only one native species, nothing else which is the main message, basically, of what we find. So four of the native species which should be in this area we can find. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're really not there, but they, they will be very, very rare, or maybe they are gone already. 
which was surprising to me in the beginning, but then in the end I was like, um, well, actually it's not that surprising when you consider what has happened to these rivers in this region. I still have hopes that there is still something left in Brunei because there has been less um, deforestation, uh, land use changes going on there. Uh, but of course, it's different permits I need there. So <laughs> what we really need, I think, is targeted service uh, for these species. Um, we also did some haplotype networks. I'm not sure if anybody's like familiar with these. It's basically based on RC1 data just to show us uh, something about the ch uh, genetic diversity of, of these species and which units we can use for conservation. So which uh, there are basically two to three conservation units for this uh, Rexidens species. Uh, it's very well structured geographically. This is what you would expect for populations that have been separated for, for many thousands of years. Uh, very different for these Chinese species. So we have haplotypes all over the place. The same haplotype, for example, here um, on the east of the Wallacea line, and also here in Peninsular Malaysia. So these obviously have been transported by people um, between the mm -hmm. islands, and this is also what we find when we talk to people, especially in Sabah. So they are they're eating them and they like to have more of them, so they're putting them into rivers, to different ponds, all over the place. <coughs> um, these are just my preliminary results. Very little I have about the ecology of these two species. So this is the native one, the red one, the black one is the non-native one. It has a very, very large niche. Uh, loves anthropogenically altered habitats, so it doesn't mind nutrient enrichment, etc. Whereas the native one is quite sensitive to eutrophication, etc. So, if my conclusions are that there are at least 14 <coughs> mussel species native to the study region, five of these 14 species I couldn't find, so they will be very, very rare, maybe already extirpated in this area. If they are extirpated in this area, some of them will be extinct. And this is very likely the similar situation for the rest of Peninsula. <coughs> uh, so we will need targeted service, including Brunei, just kind of find some remaining populations if there are any and, and really put them under protection. Uh, similar protection should be at least uh, be done for Hyreopsis velata and Rexidens sumatrensis. These are very rare species uh, <coughs> in Peninsula Malaysia, and we already kind of put in the revived uh, ICN assessment. And yeah, the very least that we can do is uh, mitigate impact of uh, logging and land use on the rivers by establishing buffer strips. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. It's of pictures of all my field assistants and uh, my funding bodies will appear at the end. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Any questions by Amanda?
Okay, thanks. So today I will present some results about MIT that we're doing on effective climatic variables in the tropical rainforest. So this is the survival in the tropical rainforest in Costa Rica. So if we think about the tropical rainforest and how to physically generate the turf there, then well, the seedlings are very tiny and most of them actually die. so far is that most of the variation in survival, turn seeding survival, is driven by rising vegetation. So generally it's very dark, but if you get in a canopy open zone, then turn seedlings are more likely to survive and actually make it to the canopy. And another big factor is um, attack on natural enemies. So when the burning zones are actually are mostly timber cattle dumps that we attacked in the first weeks of the lifespan, and seedlings die from that. So in that uh, attack by herbivores and uh, pathogens, they actually make this sense to the planting. So depending on how many conspecific seedlings, so seedlings of the same species are close by to non-tropical seedlings, uh, density of pathogens in the soil will build up because often they are specific, so specific attacks on the soil get closer, and the same might happen for herbivores. So if you have a large uh, density of conspecifics around, actually they are thicker in the right year, seedlings have a higher probability to die than when most species are, when most seedlings around are of different species. But effects of climate or climatic variation on seedling survival in tropical rainforests and tropical forests in general remain largely unknown. And most of that we know is, is based on wind shift transition zones on larger trees, and for those we know that uh, if there's a dry period, so growth will slow down. And typically, trees are known to respond to temperature, so when nighttime temperatures are higher, uh, that the wind in nighttime respiration is higher, then the tree probability slows down. And the effect is the same actually might hold true for seedling, the same will build up too. So for drought effects, we know from tropical experiments that will, of course, uh, low water availability will uh, decrease survival because of if the rest are growing slower or the seedlings which are still not as close to that environment condition. But the effects of temperature are less clear. There have been a few short-term experiments, basically in order to control climatic conditions, that either show that seedlings perform actually, tropical tree seedlings perform actually better at higher temperatures, depending on species, or the reverse. But in the field, we actually do not know what is going on. But the effects of climatic variation could also indirectly influence seedling survival, because what might happen is uh, that pathogen densities, for example, respond to climatic variation. And that is quite likely to happen, because in the wet or moist conditions, pathogen densities may increase, and the same might actually uh, be expected for higher temperatures, so higher pathogenicity and abundance. Just to, to understand possible effects of climate change in tropical tree seedling survival, we should look at both direct and indirect effects. So the hypothesis that we are testing uh, is indeed for this seedling survival, particularly during drought and um, at higher nighttime temperatures. And we expect that the effect of negative density dependence will be stronger, um, so it will be actually weaker in the dry conditions and will be stronger under higher temperatures. And to do so, we look at a long-term data set from a, uh, from a shelter biological station in Costa Rica in which seedling survival has been monitored over 30 years at six deep intervals. And Raselva is a, a very wet forest, so <coughs> 4,000 millimeters of rainfall annually, so water is actually not expected to be really a factor in the uh, seedling performance. And 
to monitor seasonal survival, we looked at five branches in those various initial nuclear deployabilities. And in each of those branch tests, season survival was monitored every six weeks. And the advantage is that it could actually capture seasonal establishment and seasonal immunization because it could happen every two or three weeks. And we focused at 142 species that we could reliably identify. And then for each one meter shared travel, we looked at the temperature, the density of these individual seedlings. We looked at the metal of light availability that was measured every year or twice per year. And um, also soil nutrient availability, in this case, the base that I recall for variation in soil. We have found that the Java is able to actually have a better station, which has recorded uh, better data every 30 minutes over the whole spring period. So in that sense, we could really quantify the climate variables over six week intervals. And here we saw that the paper pressure deficit is the same thing as an even higher paper pressure deficit due to a, a special location due to a factor to experience higher water stress, drought stress. And we focused on the mean lifetime temperature over the branches in the five weeks. And to, to look at seedling responses to um, survival responses to these predictors, we used an individual-based model. We looked at sort of the predictors that I just described, the light, soil, nutrients, temperature-specific density, paper, uh, paper pressure deficit, and light and temperature. And to actually uh, include also indirect effects of climate, we, inter uh, we included interaction in the model so that climate effects, and on each of the uh, parameters, we, we estimate them for a species separately because we expected that species would be able to respond differently to climate. And then here are some preliminary results. So this, this is basically the whole model together. And um, we, we standardized the predictors so that actually the size of the Positions indicate how strong the effect of a certain variable was. And the positive effect indicates that the predictor increased survival. So there's a positive effect in seasonal survival, a negative one that actually decreased survival. And if we then look at effects of light, we indeed see that there is a slight positive effect. So, yes, uh, light availability increased survival. The effect of soil was very weak in terms of numerical form. Yeah, species respond to very different, so some might respond negatively and positively. But surprisingly, the temp specific density effect is by far the worst. So indeed, uh, survival decreases strongly if there's a high density of specific seedlings around. And if we then look at climate effects, so first as a direct effect of paper pressure deficit, PPD, we see that it's not significant, but it tends to be positive, what would not be expected because it would indicate higher survival in the dry conditions. But there is an effect, um, it's a significant effect of uh, nighttime temperature and average expected survival was lower and nighttime temperature increased. And for the indirect effects, for the interaction between uh, conspecific density and PPD and uh, conspecific, uh, conspecific density and minimum temperature, we see the same. So there's no effects of droughts there, so of indi indirect effects of droughts on seasonal survival. But we do see that there's an interaction between conspecific density and nighttime temperature, so that um, temperature actually modifies the effect of negative, uh, negative density dependence on seedling survival. Now, if we then look at direct effects of climate, so here at the, to the the effect of PPD, and to the right, the effect of minimum temperature. And the gray line indicates the, the more common species, so those are the species specific responses, so this is highly variable. So a subspecies responses to climate vary a lot, but on average, there is no effect of uh, uh, PPD on seedling survival. There is a slight, not very big, effect of night and temperatures that decreases seedling survival. 
And if we then look at the indirect effects of temperature, so as I pointed out in this uh, igniting temperature, and then predicted survival either in that at IPOC specific density, so the 90th percentile of across all the uh, data points, and in black the local specific density, 10th percentile. And then we see that the, the effect of local specific density of night and temperature is basically negligible. So there's a strong interaction there. But if we look at uh, seasonings that have high post specific density, they are strongly negatively affected by temperature. So that indicates that there's an indirect effect of temperature and that at higher temperatures, probably temperature intensities are higher and are more strongly negatively affecting season survival. This conclusion so far from the study, there's a lot more to be explored, but we did not assign the effect of um, drought, water availability on season survival. What we did not expect, and there, there was a tendency of a positive effect of drought on season survival in the same way uh, that we found the same way when we were looking at the rainfall over the census in Nepal, that there was a negative effect of rainfall. And what could be is that a little bit of drought in this system actually improved the season performance. So before it's now been really so horrible that it would actually be good to have a little bit of drought. And as I expected, we did find uh, a negative effect of night and temperature, so it's suggesting that there's an effect there. And that there's also an indirect effect by, an in by increasing uh, temperature density. So overall, our results suggest that sure there is not a strong effect of, uh, of drought on seasonal survival, but still there's a lot of variation across species. So if conditions in the, in the future become more dry and warmer, we still would expect that species composition would change starting at least at the point of seasonal survival. Okay, I would like to thank um, people that have actually done the work over the past 13 years and the funding agencies. And I'll be happy to take any questions. So hi everyone, I'm Sarah and I've just finished my PhD at the University of York and I'm going to be talking to you today about some of the results from my field work in Borneo which looks at whether oil palm plantations are barriers to the dispersal of rainforest butterflies. So one of the central themes of my PhD research is climate change and I've been looking at the effectiveness of uh, protected areas on Borneo to conserve uh, forest species under climate warming. And some of my results have shown that uh, for many protected areas, analogous climates may shift uh, in future. And these protected areas are shown in orange. And they're primarily found at low elevation, so under 200 meters above sea level, and primarily in coastal regions. And so if you look at the forest cover map up here, uh, you can see that there's been a uh, really large amounts of deforestation in the lowlands of Borneo and this is primarily due to um, the expansion of oil palm agriculture in recent decades. And so um, for populations of species that are residing within these lowland protected areas, conditions may become unsuitable for them. They may become 
too uh, warm or too dry, and so they may need to shift or expand their ranges to uh, cooler locations at higher elevation in future. And so in order to do this, they may need to move across uh, non-forest habitats or large-scale oil palm plantation matrices. And so the functional connectivity of a landscape or how a landscape impedes uh, or facilitates the movements of tropical species is going to become increasingly important under climate change. Oh, wait, it's not working. Sorry, touch slight technical problem. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, but it's actually, there's limited data on whether forest species can actually disperse through oil palm plantation matrices. And in Southeast Asia, where the remaining forest is really fragmented, and this is just some forest cover data taken from near I was working in Sabah in Borneo from Gavio 2016. Um, it's going to be really important to uh, maintain connectivity in these fragmented landscapes and allow species movements, uh, allow species to move across uh, these types of landscapes. And so developing conservation strategies to conserve species in future is going to be really important. And so uh, for this study, I'm specifically interested in uh, the movement behavior of rainforest species at rainforest and oil palm plantation boundaries. And I'm specifically interested in whether uh, rainforest species are moving from the forest into the plantation. And this is because boundary crossing may be a prerequisite for species moving through fragmented landscapes. So if lots of forest species are moving from the forest into the plantation, they may be moving, uh, they may be dispersing through uh, the landscape. And so the overall aim of my uh, study was to determine the permeability of uh, forest and oil palm plantation boundaries to forest dependent butterflies. And I'm specifically working on uh, nymphalid or fruit feeding butterflies. So I tested three hypotheses in this study. And my first hypothesis was that I predicted that the net movement of individuals would be from rainforest into plantation. And this was based on uh, the literature of source sink dynamics and also the literature on uh, spillover. And a previous study on spillover by Jen Lucy and Jane Hill uh, have shown that uh, rainforest butterflies do spill over from the forest into the oil palm plantations. And you can see that species richness decreases the further you go into the plantation matrix. And so just as a sort of side note here, I'm specifically interested in what's going on at the boundaries of these habitats, and I don't actually go very far into either habitat type. So I also predicted that for individuals that are found in forest, uh, the plantation may act as a barrier to their movement. And so I uh, hypothesized that there would be fewer overall movements into the plantation compared to uh, within forest movements. Finally, I hypothesized that species traits uh, will influence the boundary crossing ability of certain species. And I selected a number of traits that have shown to be, uh, shown to be of importance to tropical butterflies. And these include the number of larval host plants that a butterfly, has been, uh, a butterfly species has been known to feed on, whether or not the larval host plants are found in the plantation, and I'll just refer to this as a trait for this talk. Um, and so this is quite an important point because I uh, assume that if the larval host plants of a butterfly species are not found within the plantation, then this butterfly must be forest dependent because it requires rainforest habitat to breed. I also, oops, I also looked at uh, wing size and geographic range size as well. So on to my methods then. I had four sample sites located in Sabah in northern Borneo. And I chose these sites uh, specifically because they were fairly good quality forest. Uh, the forest had been logged at least once, but the quality was similar among these sites. And they were all bordered by fairly mature oil palm uh, plantation habitats. So uh, these trees were about 15 years old or, or older. And I selected these sites uh, specifically to minimize any confounding factors of differences in forest quality across my, uh, my sample sites. I also selected the sites 
to have a very straight and clear-cut boundary between the forest and the plantation. And this is so I could set up a grid system of uh, traps across these habitats. And just as a quick side note, uh, all the results that I present today have just been accepted in by Tropica, so if you'd like any more information uh, about them, then please do have a look at that or uh, come and chat to me afterwards. So on to my uh, trap setup. I had 24 uh, butterfly traps set up in a gridded design across the forest and oil palm plantation boundary. And uh, I baited my traps with lots of rotten banana in order to intercept any butterflies that were within my study grid. Now this was a typical capture mark or capture study where the butterflies were captured daily and I checked my traps for 18 days at each site. And um, all the butterflies that came into my trap I marked with a unique number or a unique mark and then released them in the hope that I would recapture them again and then I could uh, look at their movement behavior. So now on to my results, and I just wanted to point out here that I combined all the results uh, for all my recaptures across my sites for these analyses, and this is because there wasn't enough uh, information for uh, the butterflies at individual sites to look at any site level effects. So I recaptured 1,666 butterflies of 65 species, and my recapture rate uh, was about 32%. So I recaptured 527 individuals of 28 species. And if you look at the uh, oh, white section on the pie chart, you can see the number of unique individuals that was marked in either habitat type. And then if you look at the field section of the pie chart, this represents the number of individuals that were recaptured in either forest or plantation habitats. So Basically, there were more butterflies in the plantation compared to forest, and there was a higher proportion of butterflies recaptured in the plantation. So I just wanted to point out here that I'm going to be referring to forest and plantation individuals for the rest of my talk. And uh, what I mean by that is for all the individuals that were marked in forest, these are forest individuals, and for all the individuals that were marked in plantation, these are plantation individuals, regardless of whether they cross the boundary uh, at a later point in my study. So just drawing your attention to the bar plot here, I've plotted on the y-axis the percentage of individuals that were recaptured. And uh, the lighter shading uh, shows the percentage of individuals that were recaptured in the same habitat and the percentage of individuals that crossed the boundary. So the dark shading refers to 100 individuals of 13 species that crossed the boundary at some point in my study. And so for my first hypothesis, I was looking at uh, net movement flow across these boundaries. And so for um, if you were a butterfly marked in forest and subsequently recaptured, 41% of these individuals were uh, recaptured in the plantation. Whereas for butterflies that were marked in uh, plantation, only 11% of individuals were recaptured in forest. So um, I can say that my results suggest that the net movement is from forest into plantation. And I put this into a simple chi-squared analysis and individuals were significantly more likely to cross the boundary if marked in forest. So looking at the forest individuals in a bit more detail, these individuals were more likely to move uh, to a different trap than plantation individuals and they also went further when they did move. So they're less sedentary than individuals captured in the plantation. So of all the individuals that were marked in forest and moved to a different trap, 53% crossed into plantation. And 47% moved to a different trap within forest. So actually, the plantation boundary was more permeable than I initially predicted because forest individuals had an equal chance of moving to plantation as moving within forest. However, uh, boundary crossing ability was species specific and in my third analysis I look at the uh, species traits and whether species traits are important predictors of crossing. And so I performed binomial logistic uh, regression models and this was for 16 species that I had uh, 
multiple individuals were captured moving to a different trap. So for species that I had movement data for. And for all the traits that I included in my models that were shown to be important uh, predictors of boundary crossing, I calculated the logit probabilities of moving. Uh, I calculated these probabilities for forest individuals and for plantation individuals. And um, the lighter shading here shows the probability of moving within the same habitat, and the darker shading shows the probability of moving across the boundary. So just drawing your attention to the forest individuals, um, if you were a butterfly and you uh, had your larval host plants present in the plantation, and there were 12 of these species, you were two times more likely to move into the plantation compared to species that were marked in forest with their larval host plants absent in the plantation, and there were four of those species. So the next trait that um, was shown to be of importance in uh, crossing the boundary was size. And so this graph, again, has probability of moving on the y-axis. And I calculated this for forest individuals and plantation individuals, and for large and for small species. And so again, drawing your attention to the forest individuals, if you were a small butterfly marked in forest, you were two times more likely to move into the plantation <coughs> compared to larger individuals. So basically, boundary crossing was affected by species traits and smaller individuals that could uh, uh, breed in the plantations dominated this boundary crossing. So just in summary then, my results suggest that uh, individuals are spilling over from the forest into the plantation. However, this crossing is dominated by small species that have their larval host plants present in the plantation matrix. And if you look at these guys, these are uh, butterflies in the genre Mycolesis, and they're in the Satyrinae. And um, some of their larval host plants are grass, of which are abundant in plantation matrices. And so, yeah, these are dominating the boundary crossing, whereas the forest species, the larger forest species, potentially of conservation concern, are crossing much less frequently. And so, if these species are crossing the boundaries, um, in fairly low density, it's unlikely that they're dispersing across uh, the matrix and potentially may not be able to track cooler climates if uh, the forest habitat that they're residing in becomes unsuitable for them. So in terms of what we can do uh, in relation to conservation strategies, maintaining and increasing connectivity between protected areas is going to be really important uh, for conserving tropical forest species. And my results suggest that maybe forest corridors would be more effective than stepping stones because if populations of forest species can't actually leave the forest, then stepping stones may be of limited value. But uh, we do need further research to determine this. Finally, um, we can also look into improving the quality of the matrix, which may allow more uh, species to move from the forest through the plantations and facilitate dispersal through the oil palm plantation matrices. I couldn't have done this on my own. Uh, thank you very much to everyone on here, and thanks very much uh, for listening. Hi everyone, um, I'm Olivia. Um, I'm going to be presenting you some work that I did during my postdoc at the University of York, um, and it follows on quite nicely from Sarah's work. Um, before I start, I just want to say a big thank you to our Ethiopian partners um, who selected the data, um, particularly to Professor Chris Gatt, who selected this data for his master's. Um, so this talk is looking at how butterfly diversity would maintain across that whole agricultural matrix. So you weren't just looking at that barrier between the habitats, but how they were maintained across the landscape as a whole. Um, so the study took place in Dimmer Highlands in Ethiopia. Um, so Ethiopia Highlands.
form part of the eastern um, Afro-Monte Rhino Grocery Hotspot. So it's a really important ecological region, um, but it's quite understudied when you compare it to other parts of East Africa, such as Tanzania and Kenya. Um, and it's really rapidly changing. It's experiencing very high levels of deforestation, um, as is a lot of East Africa. Um, and our recent work has shown that more than a third of that mountain forest has been lost between 2001 and 2009. Um, there's a long tradition of cotton harvesting within Ethiopia. So cotton grows um, wild in these forests, and traditionally would have been harvested from beneath the canopy. Um, it's now cultivated in these semi-managed cotton forests, so the cotton um, will be grown under natural forests, but the trees will be thinned to allow an extra light, and shrub will be cleared to maximise the yield. Um, but it's a pretty um, low-intensity agroforestry system. Um, it's been shown to be really important for bird diversity, um, and here we were wondering how it was going to affect those butterflies, and hopefully that it can support tropical butterflies. There's then been quite a recent increase in timber plantations which can relieve the growing population. Um, so a five-fold increase in the past 20 years. Um, and these timber plantations are essentially monocultures, so primarily eucalyptus. Um, they were dominated by one tree species. We've lost the natural um, forest canopy. Um, so we're interested in the differences between those traditional agroforestry systems and a more intensive forest monoculture. Um, the rest of the agricultural ma matrix um, is a bit more intensive, so we've really lost most of those trees. Um, you're going to have areas of open woodland, um, but also a lot of annual cropland um, and pasture. Um, so the Ethiopian team was survey surveying um, understory butterflies using Transex surveys um, in 29 one hectare plots across the landscape. Um, so we have this one transect which covers all of those bamboo spikes through from the remaining forests, so semi-natural forests, timber plantations, semi-managed cotton forests, and SM being the cotton forest, woodland, cropland, and pasture. Um, and the first thing I want to know is simply how is the diversity changing across this landscape? Um, so if you were in the plenary this morning, you should know all about um, diversity indices and the order of the key, which I've used here. So this is Hill's diversity. Um, it's an alpha diversity measure. Um, the order of key we simply choose as richness, but then we've got um, salmon and simpsons, but um, correct this so that you can compare the diversity directly. And really what you can see here is that quite clearly natural forests have the highest butterfly, butterfly diversity, um, which possibly isn't surprising. Um, you can see also that the plantations in the cotton forest have very similar levels of diversity for all three orders of skew. Um, but really diversity is dropping off when you get into that more intensive landscape, um, the open woodlands and pastures and croplands. So, Huge difference in diversity here from around the tree, the croplands up to between um, 10 and 14 for the natural forest. Um, the next thing was okay, so diversity seems to be relatively high within um, cotton forest and timber plantations, but are the species the same species that we're finding in natural forest? Um, so, again, we use species similarity here, weighted to the order of two. Um, looking at the number of species that are shared between natural forests um, and the other habitats. So all of these are similarities to the forest. Um, and what you can see up the top, both plantations and cotton forests have very high levels of species similarity. Um, so this is kind of between 0 0.8 and 0.9. So essentially between 80 and 90 percent of species present within timber plantations and cotton were also in natural forests. Um, not only that, because we've got very high similarity for the higher orders of Q, that means they weren't just present, they were also represented in similar relative abundances in the two different habitat types, or the three different habitat types. So the quite modified agricultural habitats are actually supporting um, similar species to the forest and in the same relative abundances. Um, very different story when you get into 
to the woodlands and the poplars and pastures. So they're sharing about 70 percent of their species with forests. But when you get to high end of the tree, um, similarity drops right down. So they're not representing them in the same way as the abundance. So they're being dominated by a different species. Um, again, so in this section we look at ecological traits, how that differs across the landscape. Um, and we categorize them according to the ecological habitat categories, such as in the big size of the literature. Um, first, we looked at forest dependent species, so we might be expecting there was a drop off in habitat for a timber plantation um, or coffee forest, but actually we found they were occurring at similar abundances in forest plantations and coffee forests, and it was just in the woodlands, poplars, and pastures that they were dropping off. Um, very similar patterns for the class egg species. Um, and again, for mice tree species, so they seem to be more abundant in the forest plantations and coffee forests. When we looked at open habitat specialists, um, we thought they would probably be more abundant in the open habitat, but they weren't. Um, so even they seem to be more abundant actually in the plantations um, and forests and coffee forests really dropping off to the high end of the pasture. Um, widespread tree trees were one of the only ones that were more abundant in that intensive agricultural landscape, so they actually seem to prefer that open, open woodland. Um, the last thing that we heard in Sarah's talk, the important, uh, importance of dispersal, um, and even though we were finding high, relatively high diversity within this modified landscape, there was a negative correlation with distance in the natural forest. So um, here we've got log abundance and species richness, so the diversity between order of two equals zero. Um, and both of them have this negative correlation with distance in the forest. So um, there's something going on there. So to summarise, this study shows that agricultural land uses clearly having a very strong impact on the understory butterfly community in this biodiversity hotspot. Um, it also shows that um, forested agriculture, such as timber plantations and coffee forests, are a lot, a lot more beneficial to forest butterflies than more intensive forms of agriculture, such as poplins, um, poplins and open woodland. Um, but the really interesting thing that we weren't expecting in this study was that there didn't really seem to be a difference between those intensive timber plantations and those really traditional coffee agroforests. Um, so that seemed to have potentially quite important implications for management of um, butterfly communities in the region, um, because if butterflies are able to utilise these more intensive agricultural landscapes such as timber plantations, then they can potentially use them um, as dispersal corridors. Um, again, we did find this negative correlation with distance from forest, so forestry is important, um, and as we heard earlier, larval host plants are really important, so though the adults are moving through timber plantations and coffee forests, they might not necessarily be breeding there, um, and these habitats might not have the larval host plants, or they might have different microclimatic conditions that are not friendly to agriculture conversion. Um, so it really is essential to conserve the forest. Um, I don't think anyone in this room would disagree with that, but there's no way that we're going to conserve these um, butterfly communities without protecting our natural forest. Um, but um, the results of this sub study show that the traditional coffee forests and potentially these monoculture um, eucalyptus plantations may be able to support movement of adult butterflies to the main strip. Um, understanding more about that process of movement will clearly be important for planning um, landscape management within the region. Um, that's it. Thank you for listening. Any questions?
session. Um, I just want to quickly put one more slide up. So if you want to uh, speak about any of the talks that you have heard, um, please also include the uh, best shape hashtag in it so we can play some kind of uh, Twitter, I'm not a Twitter person, I should know again, <laughs> some kind of Twitter, Twitter feed related to all the typical talks. Uh, also, please include the, the BES 2016. And as I said at the beginning, there will be an early career researcher meeting uh, specifically focused on tropical ecology in Lancaster at the end of March. And if you want more information on that, please um, look at the website. Um, there's a blog post about the, the Lancaster meeting with the registration details included. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and um, see you later. <laughs>
Did you see the tape deck that was put with the Tokyo Marine Club and Essex Club? So let's say she tries to do the PT Island Trip City Tube. We had very little vocabulary and certainly not up to the um, quality control level. So the real paradox is the steering decision, because not only do we have very low German notions, but we have very few people that are trained in the military. And so this one, we think that actually it should be more geared to, and then the induction of um, being into the city should have be promoted the military that is acquired during the maturation. And we suggest that this is being done more geared to protect the civilian population from the steering decision. So really what this shows you is that working the wild seems to be complicated. And again, it really emphasizes the importance of looking at different countries because you do get to the same. So I just wanted to highlight maybe something that we do get more in at the NCR community. So, and one of them is to look at the role of submergence and flooded environments and understanding how to control risk to um, protection. Another one is to look at the beneficial um, effects of the rail and other beneficial effects of rail management, as we demonstrated just now. Another area is around Any other subcontrols that we that we could mention in our survey. And then of course lastly around the impact of climate change, how it can get more temperature around the um, algae level and create permanent heat cycles. So just to wrap up, um, sea tolerance is a function of ocean erosion that carries a conventional complexion, but its interaction is really important. It's a source of functional phenotype, and we know that seas have a mechanism that mimics that to facilitate their motion um, in sailing environments. And of course, toxicity in the groundwater is phenotype. We know that it's a constant toxicity that we need to understand for many different species. And so I'd just like to finish by thanking um, my colleagues and also um, Chris Ashton and the MOTD staff for providing time.
I must say that my presentation is filled with uh, uh, foundation of thinking, you know, with the professor is focused on the scientific side. But I think maybe I should um, give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, it's a, let's say, <coughs> first I say it's what the foundation is uh, trying to do. So if you have the experience, is further to the extent. But in cross sectional of this, the base that are with the boundary is there, and the extension here to upper and lower today is for the boundary to the extent. The link with boundary to the extension is called capital by C, and the basic result is that uh, is called the form by C. And because of that, the inner space in capital by C are separated
here, three times the same here. That's a combination with the evaluation total values and the evaluation, total values and the evaluation, and total values and the previous. You will consider the combination of the total values and the previous values before the test condition is applied to the second field. And we introduce the new work due to satisfy boundary field extension. This is a game to the boundary field extension. And we verify the new extension in the loop. And under that, boundary field extension applies a wide range. So we actually manage to replace the, the range and calculate the error of the new field. This type, we take the evidence of boundary field extension for all cases. And as a result, total values used as boundary field extension is minor and very minor. But total values used uh, only for that uh, event, boundary field extension, only in later events. Uh, two points about the business method property. We conducted the new camera again. Uh, we cut the critical loop lambda of the uh, defined direction. We create the Rowland displacement curve. From this curve, we calculate the speed in both loops, maximum speed to zero one and one to zero from the plane. Uh, for this work I use, we measure four items here. The work one is by acoustic regulation, which has satisfied by pressure gradient time analysis. And we measure the thermal conduction before, uh, before noon and in the day. And also the deep water potential at the ground and the sea. Finally, we measure the linear carbon free reactive ratio to neutralize the any time water in the sea. Uh, for function for other plate, we measure the function of plate, including leaf mass area or the uh, divide mass by two dimensional distribution or the chain. Okay, let's show the result. Part is a relationship between boundary field extension and the response uncertainty of the new point. Uh, contrary to our hypothesis, the boundary field extension density was not related to this range. Uh, this is true across all species operating in the loop. This is this is equally parallel to the defined field. Uh, in contrast, the boundary field extension density for the relation is the deep water flow. Increase, increase in boundary field extension density is related to the higher thermal conduction, but at the same time, lower water resistance. Similarly, increase in boundary field extension density is related to the higher GS1, but also the higher initial displacement. Uh, finally, we analyze the Applying the law of the boundary field extension as a linear in the increase, increase of boundary field extension, uh, the energy life value for potential distribution are obvious. Uh, the hypothesis has been rejected by most people. Uh, we can analyze the law of boundary field extension in the water we just used. The meaning in boundary field extension 
and she looks at what, what she can pass to show that she can pass some things that are really literate and very basic skills. So there was kind of some emphasis on those vocabulary and those types of things, and some repetition, and then very little on the actual song, which is in a lot more detail. And so she was looking at straight capture, which is the essential of straight capture. She was looking at how tricky the links were. The trickier they are, the more complex the language, the more likely they are to have strokes. She was confused because she said they had more or less joint repetition or completion than the straight capture problem to do. Looking at actual straight capture, she was expecting many notes more likely to repeat the other side, so it's actual strokes, because they don't move as much in the other side. So she thought that would be true. She looked at the diet, so what, what was the composition given the actual size, the size of the fibers, um, and she assumed that wouldn't change in response to nitrogen deficiency. She looked at how much they rely on climate change, so in all the nitrogen that is being climate change and how they rely on climate change to do that change. So I think for that bit. Um, and she did this, so we're looking at nitrogen deposition to do some two studies. So there's a, there's a, there's a little paper here, two case studies. Um, one had very, very high nitrogen deposition input, so that's where depending on the concentration you use, it's really high. Um, and one had low, but still quite high input of about 8 kilograms of nitrogen deposition. Um, so we've got two sides, they differ in lots of ways, but the major way they differ is in nitrogen deposition. So quite nicely that we have had some bad numbers in this study. Um, uh, yeah, measuring um, nitrogen from prey uses a natural handling program. So um, the, the prey are um, hypothetically enriched, so the nitrogen in the prey um, has a tricky nature because it is um, got more tricky in there than the nitrogen you might get in a sea fish or something like that. It's heavier than that. As you know, the trickiness is that the prey they kill can be weak at straight capture points, and you know the trickiness is that the decline, you can work out how much nitrogen is in there, which is the thing that makes it very tricky. So her results. So firstly, looking at trickiness, um, found that the fastest growing at the low end of the position side was twice as tricky as those at the high end of the position side. So measure trickiness by sticking um, little bits of bits of silver paper onto the leaves and using a force gauge. So the ones at the low end of the position side use twice as force as the ones at the high end of the position side. Which is a little easier to see if they're pulling more weight than the weight. And then she looked at the, the likelihood of them catching the prey. So this is prey capture, which is how likely are they to catch prey from the other side. So comparing their prey capture to the same little prey that they catch. Um, so she found that the ones at the low end of the position side were much more likely to catch prey. Again, that's what we would expect. If it was on less than prey capture, But the, the thing with this study was the, the abundance of prey at the low end of the position side and the degree of prey <coughs> was much lower at the high end of the position side. So you're sticking some prey very little. But the overall result was that actual prey capture didn't differ between the prey and the sea fish side. And this was really, really, really surprising. What we expected was that the ones at the low end of the position side would catch more prey and that might be kind of a treat for shearers. But it was, it was nothing like that. Um, she looked at plant diets and she found um, that the plants at the high deposition side were more likely to catch um, citra. They caught a lot more citra flies um, and they were more likely to catch insects in the larger frame side. So you're getting quite a shift in, in kind of what they eat at the position side as well. Um, their plant nutrition, so the ones at the high deposition side, they all contain more prey. They get a lot more nitrogen. Deposition, so loads more nitrogen in them. Um, but again, what was really surprising was that the nitrogen they get from prey didn't differ from those at the low end of the position side. So all the extra nitrogen in the tissue came from, from the upper half. So that's the, the, the nitrogen from that was more prey capture in the group. Again, really surprising. We were expecting, or Joni was expecting, um, prey and nitrogen to, to be much more shared than the group at the position side. So they don't catch more either prey. So there's a summary of the whole thing. So they, at the high end deposition site, they increase their investment in prey capture, but they don't have any changes in actual prey capture. Um, diet changes a bit, um, and they're reliant on prey nitrogen, which is weak. But that's because weak on that side can increase. Um, so, so we kind of think about that in terms of ecosystem responses to, to nitrogen deposition. It's a, it's a complex system. Um, and it's quite a nice complex system to be 
reasons to go forward. Um, so it, it, it's both important to us as implementing kind of multiple interactions and actors. And it's quite likely that for this system, it will be you know, non-linear responses and outcome recognition. Um, and it's actually important to be thinking about um, network kind of ecosystems and community contexts, which each of these is part of kind of these very, very complex network of sensors and interconnected connection systems that, that can happen. So here we've got um, uh, end deposition down here on the bottom left. Um, that will affect productivity and habitat coexistence productivity. Um, that might affect prey availability. So if you get more pet habitat, you get more insects, you get more prey. End deposition also affects pet prey then. More end deposition, more area of pet prey, uh, which is then taken up by the plant. So it, it, end deposition can impact on plants and systems through two, two different pathways. Um, and so you can get kind of idiosyncratic issues with what's unexpected. So it's quite an interesting system. It's only two sites, so it needs to be done a lot more research to find out you know, how, how do these two different kind of ways that the plants get sliced and how do they interact. That's it. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you very much there, John. It's quite dull. Yep. <laughs> um, and we've got plenty of time for questions. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, very good. Thank, thank you. Thank you.
going to talk to you today about uh, the work that I've been doing at my PhD. Okay, so I'm going to quickly um, throw up the sort of um, intro to the thing I'm here to talk to you about today briefly, and um, talk to you about the research questions that I was interested in, uh, present some of the research and results, as well as some RNA sequence work that I've done, and then talk about what I've been seeing um, in the future work for the rest of my PhD. Okay. So to begin with, um, silicon is a quadrate crystal nutrient, but it's most quite trying to hide the dark silicon, so they don't uh, require it completely light up, for example, uh, but they tend to be much better than normal wax silicon. Um, so I've just picked up here, so on the left-hand side you've got some wild type rice, um, and then on the right-hand side you've got um, a low silicon mutant, and obviously the wild type rice is going much better. Um, and over here we can see that the low silicon mutant has actually been eaten more by um, insects and herbivores compared to the wild type. And so it uptake in silicon has um, many advantages for plants. Um, it's primarily utilized by grasses, although other plant farmers can take that and use silicon um, as a defense mechanism, um, such as cheap herbaceae. Um, it's used in uh, fidget roses, so uh, plants take it up and then deposit silicon um, as solid um, uh, phytolith. So this is an example of a phytolith. Um, deposit it on the leaf surface, um, and then this is a phytum, so where it's grown is, is where it's enriched with um, silicon, um, and that sort of grows loads of leaf heads so that you might see um, when you touch um, grasses. Um, it can also be used to prime um, plant roots and things if they're trying to grow um, from the system. Um, and so why do we actually care uh, about silicon? Well, silicon is very important in plant herbivore interaction, so plant, as I said, plants take up silicon to defend themselves, um, against predators. And it's also important for sustainable crop production. Um, so with the increasing change in um, climate, for example, um, plants are able to do better with stresses uh, when they have access to silicon. So throughout um, the past few decades, um, there's been uh, quite a lot of evidence that suggests um, that silicon um, is an invisible plant defense. Um, so uh, there's not only current from the 1980s farm for um, a historic grassland that had been grazed on contains more silicon um, than grasslands that hadn't been um, grazed on by herbivores. And much of the work uh, by um, Matthew and Hartley um, in the past um, sort of 10 uh, years has focused on um, looking into bulls and other herbivorous studies. Um, so this graph is just an example of some of the work that they've done. And um, it's, it's just uh, silicon <coughs> content in three different species of grass. Um, and the important thing is that uh, when you look at the white bars, which um, haven't had any herbivores, um, they contain much less silicon than the black bars, which have had all herbivores. Um, so you can see here that uh, the, the two species are both reacting by increasing the silicon uh, concentration in the leaves. Um, so we've got quite a lot of evidence now that, um, to back up that silicon is um, an invisible plant defense, but we still don't quite fully know the mechanisms behind why silicon um, is reduced in this way. So just to briefly discuss how silicon is taken up into the plant. Um, so you've got uh, a number of transporters. So um, silicon is taken up as monosilicic acid. Um, it's taken up through a channel type uh, transport, LSI1, which is bit specific. Um, it's then passed on to a, an influx transporter, um, which, is, um, which uses a proton pump to actively pump the silicon up through the xylem and then up into the shoot. Um, we also find that LSI6 is present in the root. Um, it's primarily found in the root tip, and the function of this is actually unknown why this transporter is found in the root currently. Uh, then moving up into the shoot, um, we've got um, LSI6, uh, which takes the silicon uh, from the xylem and um, passes it on to, um, cooperatively with LSI2 and LSI3. It pumps uh, silicon up into areas of low transpiration um, and the silicon gets deposited in places like the plant zone and nodes, and also um, in the leaf. So I work on Prof Vesky, which is a commercial soy um, shape grass, um, and I work in collaboration with BLS Hydroleum, who are a plant breeding um, company and a seed company. Um, Prof Vesky is an extremely stress tolerant and adaptive plant, so it's quite useful, um, as I said, with the uh, current climate, but it's got a large root system um, and it's easy, it easily deals with stress, um, so it's quite a good model to work with. And I've been given a number of different grain varieties, so um, they contain different leaf textures, which have been qualitatively assigned by the plant breeders, and they've been assigned sort of hard and soft varieties. So I've chosen a subsection of these varieties, and I think this bit 
quite often the house plant can accumulate much more soil upon than the pepper plants do. And also the um, house plants tend to deposit um, silicon in a larger number of um, different cell structures, so pythons and quite often the acorn. So the research um, so the question that I'm sort of interested in is the to do with the molecular mechanisms behind silicon oxide. So we've seen a lot of um, I've done quite a few uh, glass house experiments. We've seen quite a lot of glass house experiments done into um, silicon being taken up and being industrially um, dispensed. But there hasn't been quite as many studies done on um, the molecular aspects of this. So I'm interested in um, how the expression of um, the main silicon transport is um, differs between two different varieties of uh, Todd Besky, so one a hard variety and a very soft variety. And then I'm also interested in if we see um, an induction response in terms of an upright reaction in the silicon transported in terms of um, damage quantity. Uh, so the design of the experiment, um, I had, um, as I say, two different varieties, a hard variety and a soft variety. And I damaged um, half of them and then um, the other half were undamaged. Um, and from, th from this, I analyzed the silicon content of the plants and then from a subsection of this, um, I extracted RNA from three reps um, of the hard and soft variety from the root material. Um, then I did some alumina hydrates on this and um, I analyzed the RNA seq results using the Trinity pipeline and anaerobic generator, so Trinity X um, pipeline, and um, did some differential gene expression analysis using the HR package. So I'll show you some silicon results. So, um, Overall, the harsh um, variety had higher silicon concentration than the soft variety, um, with white bars represent undamaged uh, plants and the green bars represent damaged plants. Um, and we can see that um, overall, the harsh variety, without any damage, has more silicon compared to the soft variety. But we also see an induction response in terms of the silicon content. Um, so we can see that the harsh variety is responding by increasing silicon uptake, but we don't see this response in the soft variety. Um, so the next question is, what is causing this induction response and is it molecular? Uh, so um, I've had quite a number, so this, I'm going to show you the next two slides which are the differentially expressed genes um, that I find. Um, so these graphs are um, just represent the, all the different genes that are differentially expressed. And if it's red, it means that they are significantly differentially expressed. Um, but I'm going to just focus in on the silicon transport because we've got so much time. Um, so in the undamaged plants, <coughs> found that LSI2, which is the active silicon transporter, um, shows higher expression in the hard variety compared to the soft variety. Uh, so this might explain why we see um, that it's got, um, without any damage, it has more silicon uh, compared to the softer variety. Um, and I did, when I looked um, at within uh, varieties, between two groups, so um, within the, so the soft variety, there was no difference between the damage and undamaged plants in terms of the silicon transporters, and that was the same for um, the hard variety. So then looking at the damaged plants between the soft variety and the hard variety, um, I've, I've summarized the silicon transporter um, results in this table and essentially um, the results are similar to what I found um, in the undamaged plants. So the hard variety had an upregulation of the uh, efflux uh, transporter um, compared to the soft variety. And then we also see an upregulation in this LSI6 um, transporter that is found in the root. Um, and then um, overall, basically, the hard variety has, it looks like it is actively pumping more silicon up into the damaged genes uh, where it is being used to defend itself. Uh, so overall, um, the hard variety has got a higher genes expression of the root reflux transporter, and this might explain why we see, um, uh, we quite often see much more silicon present in this variety compared to uh, the soft variety. And we do see um, a molecular expression for the damage response in terms of um, the increase um, in silicon in the damaged um, plants of the hard variety. Um, and then uh, I think something that's important is I haven't actually looked at the role of LSI6 in this group, so um, that may be something that I would look at into the, in, the, in future to see if it's being upregulated um, as well um, in terms of the silicon duplicity. And then in terms of the future work, I'm going to do some um, qPCR to try and quantify this and as a sort of proof of concept, prove that this is a good sort of approach to validate um, sleep and health. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. So thanks everybody. All my funding and my supervisors um, and my lab group for supporting me. Thanks very much.
um, sometimes in the Greek, sometimes in, in the English context, I believe, as well. I also see politics. It's not in the Bible now, but it's, it's sort of just stuck there. Often there'll be this big bang theory that cycles are literally plants dying, and sometimes you sort of have the layer under the cuticle and just have one explosion of something called the bang theory. Um, while it's considered not essential, it does seem to participate in the elimination or help plants tolerate a huge range of stresses. So these can be um, both biotic stresses, so we see that having too many chemical plants stress by disease or by um, pest um, bugs and uh, pest insects, and they can can adding a chemical will reduce the supply of nutrient damage. We also see, um, as we saw in the previous talk, alleviation of disease damage in, in that subsystem. It also seems to alleviate a range of abiotic stresses, so which means sort of salinity, drought, heavy metal, um, chemical stresses, and physical stresses, so wind damage, heat damage, high light damage. So we see a whole range of situations where adding chemicals do help stress the plants. Um, there's a number of um, qualitative reviews that have sort of compiled studies that have looked at um, the alleviation of stresses by activism, and we particularly highlight four kind of mechanisms or very loose mechanisms. So it seems that things can stimulate plant reactiveness, which means that chemicals can help dissipate the strong metals, sort of removing their toxic um, capacity. Sometimes it can mobilize uh, metals in the soil, so when they're sugar coated too strongly, so the plants will take up less aluminium, for example. And it also seems to change the ratio of elements that are taken up by plants. So these are qualitative reviews that compiled all of the evidence in sort of directly on those issues. But I was interested in whether we could sort of pin this down a little bit more and do a more quantitative analysis. So they now hundreds of studies where people have applied different stresses to plants and they applied sugar chemical measures in response to each. So what I was able to do is compile a whole hundred of histories of these studies. Um, they typically had plants, and it took the soil, a stressed plant, the plant in the soil with sugar chemicals, and a stressed plant with sugar chemicals. Um, and these were obviously replicated and they caught responses and, and, and sort of measure of variance. The responses typically include biomass, they were tested to stress and dysphosis, antioxidant enzymes, and plant climate concentrations. So combining these in a, in a robust meta-analysis lets us really <coughs> quantify whether these responses are consistent across species. So to do this, what I used in the plot slide was compare the, um, the responses to control and release in the wild bat rabbit food variants. It would be really nice to quantify sort of the percentage that sugar can help alleviate the stress. But what I found is the amount of alleviation is um, highlighted in one percentage. So that's sort of not being classical bird browsing, it's actually I just took off of that um, extra step more than you would have seen. So I'm going to show you a number of plots that are collected. I'll take you through the first one. Um, a bit more slowly. So here's our effect size. Um, so it's sort of, you can think about it a bit like the number of standard deviations above and below the normal wave. Um, so let's concentrate on the red dot. So this is the overall dry weight response when you add sugar chemicals to a stressed plant. This is the zero line. So because it's a positive number, it means there's more dry weight when you give a stressed plant silicon compared to a stressed plant without silicon. The bars are defined for 95% intervals. And so if we cross zero, we consider it a non significant effect, like this one, and if it doesn't cross zero, we consider it a positive <coughs> effect or a negative effect. So here we can see the red is the sheep and the blue is the wheat. When you add silicon to a stressed plant, across all um, studies that have had um, uh, 175 replicates out of 143 different groups, there's been a positive increase in the biomass. Um, I had a look at the hidden peak and some of the different types of stresses to apply. So you can see that silicon can alleviate um, a range of different stresses and it's been looked at for a range of different stresses. Um, the sample sizes for many are not very big, so it's very difficult to, to sort of make comparisons between them. And for the sample size for the stresses such as water and salinity that we have quite a big number, so we don't really see a significance between different, um, different stress types. This is the same number for the dry weight, so there's an increase in the dry weight um, with silicon addition. And here I've highlighted by family. So different families accumulate silicon to different extents compared to Horatia, uh, sort of a, a 
same as trying to see the Labour and their other families that accumulate more silicon versus less silicon as well. Um, and the policy of some preservation to try and decide. But we see excavation that doesn't necessarily accumulate large amounts. Um, there's some positive effects, but not significant. The brackets aren't known for their silicon accumulation, so that means that some silicon is of a significant importance as well. So some of this dry weight accumulation um, could be can be attributed to an increase in global temperature. So for somewhat smaller samples like this, we saw a significant increase in when we compare October 56 um, interest current when it failed to run with silicon. A demo has divided it into stress types for the family, and there's definitely not enough. Um, the, the numbers aren't big enough to disentangle the relationship between family and stress type. So what I tried to do was pull out um, the Palesi dictionary orange so that we could start to look for differences between interactions between stress types and families. But I think there's still not quite enough numbers and big enough numbers for me to be confident to say that and the mean interest in two different patterns is something like. Um, but I think it's important to start looking for these patterns. So we see that con silicon consistently increases global deposit rates, and we saw a drastic change in historic distances as well. So what, what's the clinician doing? So what we see in, in the absolute interest stress chart is a consistent reduction in stress in deposit, but with a total deoxidative stress and MGA. For the same silver plot, we see this overall significant reduction and um, separated by stress type and plant type. Um, again, I've pulled out the Palesi and, and I think this is quite, quite a, a strong message because we see a couple that cross the zero line but no are um, more rare or so almost any of the experiments that we're compiling here about Palesi showed a reduction in these stress indicators in terms of these silicons. So one of the mechanisms of the ANDA is that they, uh, Peter has suggested to increase um, the production of antioxidants, which is a general don't like this, but we don't see the same response. So we, um, when we look at the overall effect size um, across experiments here for 82 and here for 86, we don't see um, a reduction in um, we don't see any things from antioxidants like the roses, which is actually um, an overall, um, more, more significant overall effect. And I think that's because, um, depending on stress type, there can actually be different mechanisms. So we wouldn't expect um, to see the same pattern in antioxidants. And I think perhaps here for a sod, um, most of them cross the zero line, perhaps here there's some interesting patterns. And I think as we go through more studies, we can start to look at how um, different antioxidants might be responding, might be uh, increased with silicon um, or decreased depending on the stress type. Silicon seems to, adding silicon changes the uptake uh, or the final um, plant content of a number of different elements. I appreciate these graphs are a little bit small, but I've just sort of summarised responses here. So on the plant for stress, we see an increase in potassium uptake, a decrease in sodium uptake, which perhaps the um, explainer on silicon might be involved in um, increasing plant performance for stress. We see a decrease in cadmium uptake and um, no significant impact on neighbouring stress. So <coughs> my, my question going into this analysis was um, stress plants have consistent responses in silicon fertilizer or phosphorus and contained stress plants or silicon in the stress plant without silicon. And the results were really quite nice. So we saw this consistent increase in dry weight. We saw a consistent increase in silicon usages. And lastly, we saw a consistent reduction in um, stress indicators. We didn't see a consistent reduction in, um, in antioxidants, but in line with what we're expecting because we think there's a whole lot of different mechanisms involved. Interesting to me was that both high and low accumulation of silicon seem to benefit. So it's not just the Palesi that shows uh, a positive response to silicon, but rather a whole range of different other toxicity ratings. And although these other toxicity ratings are sort of 
celebrate the family that we're talking about, the new decontaminants and martyrs and the Buddhist martyrs. Um, it's really a fascinating thing, so the group suggesting it's not related to this one family. Um, and what about in natural history? So this is what's happening in agriculture. What, what about in natural history? Um, there's a handful of studies using non-agricultural species, and they design experiments to see if they expose small plants to stresses and then they treated them. And they've shown that trees can alleviate some of the stresses. They also use some salinity and drought cutting of copper um, and some heavy metals. Interestingly to me, that these species are really varied. So for mangrove studies, um, this is sort of a, a, a woody species with um, a succulent leaf. This is Spartina, the, um, uh, the sort of salt marsh plant we heard about earlier. This is a nitrogen fixating sort of herbaceous species. So it's one of these species with um, a few um, uh, English plants that are non-agricultural. They're really quite diverse. So this suggests to me that perhaps silicon is playing uh, an important role in natural history to alleviate the rage of, of abiotic stresses. So what do we know? So this is not. Um, the, the benefits of silicon are not limited to silicon accumulation species. They don't seem to be limited to herbaceous plants. We're saying that this is a a fast life cycle that's like a few trees. And from other studies that I have shown here, we know that silicon um, changes genetic expression. So we see differences in proteins, lots of proteomics and things. So adding silicon changes the several rules in how we react and um, but what we don't know is whether silicon benefits are in the stress offering or frequently or just temporarily. Um, we don't know if silicon will become more important under a change in climate, as Michael just suggested. So if plants face any stresses that they haven't encountered before, perhaps silicon will help. Um, we don't know if silicon is a signaling molecule. We know it's around silicon we see sort of proteomic changes, but um, is, is silicon the, the signaling molecule here? And does silicon availability of other benefits to this? So all soil is chock full of silicon. So is it available to plants? Is it limited? Um, so this this shows me yes agricultural um, species yes that the North Americans uh, uh, have have limitations in in terms of how much they can produce from a nature body but it suggests to me that perhaps we can possibly know some different within natural natural ecosystems that we are not really paying attention to um, that they could be interested in, in investigating further. If you want to read about it, there's a special issue of functional ecology all about silicon which came out earlier this year. Um, and I'm not excited to connect to um, Professor Stephen Smith about this one in the lecture. I would be happy to have him come and speak in the next lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Agricultural studies are interested in the world, which I didn't look at here. I think if they had a positive view, it was more likely to get studied. And I think that they should look at this less as subject to publication bias. So I went for instance to Sir Michael Brown at RFA and all of his articles. I think he didn't want to work on such subjects. So I think you would perhaps rely on that as well. But I think some of the others